Hey everyone, it's Jamie. Today, I'm re-releasing a previous episode of Murderish. It's the case of Daisy De La O, who was fatally stabbed in her own community. Daisy's case garnered no leads or public attention until it was posted on TikTok. It was then that true crime social media jumped in to help. Thanks to the activity on social media about Daisy's case, a suspect would eventually be identified, but not before he slipped out of the area undetected. The opinions expressed in this episode do not necessarily reflect those of the Murderish podcast. Sensitive topics are discussed. Listener discretion is advised. The case covered in this episode involves instances of intimate partner violence. Please take care before listening. When a young Hispanic woman was fatally stabbed in her own community, her friends and family quickly honed in on a fairly obvious suspect. But the case garnered no leads or public attention until it was posted on TikTok. It was then that true crime social media jumped in to help. Thanks to the activity on social media about her case, a suspect would eventually be identified but not before he slipped out of the area undetected. This is Jamie, and you're listening to Murderish. Join me as I walk you through the case involving Daisy De La O. This case takes us to Los Angeles County, to the city of Compton. The city has a notorious reputation in pop culture for violence and poverty tucked right up against the glitz and glamour of Los Angeles. The city garnered worldwide attention after gangster rap became prevalent, and big-name rappers like Dr. Dre, Easy e and Kendrick Lamar featured their hometown in the lyrics of their songs. Although it earned the distinction as being a good city in which to start a business in the mid-1990s, Compton's poverty rate has remained in the double digits, climbing from about 12% then to a little over 19% now. Residents of Compton are nearly three times more likely to be the victim of violent crime in comparison to the national average. From the 1960s through the mid-2000s, Homicide rates in the area spiked at times of civil unrest, becoming the nation's highest in 1969. But data from the LA Times Homicide Report says that in 2021, only 36 people were killed in Compton. One of those was 19-year-old Daisy De La O. On February 23, 2021, Daisy's body was discovered face down in an alley right next to her home. She was covered in a rug and dumped near the site of her Compton apartment complex, a series of two-story tan buildings on South Long Beach Boulevard. The property manager, Juan Tellez, found her, although he wasn't sure at first what was inside of the roll of carpet. Tellez said to ABC7 News, I got scared when I saw the body because it surprised me. I never found a body right there, so I picked up the carpet. Oh my God. According to the Los Angeles County Coroner's report, the cause of death was multiple sharp force injuries. Daisy had been stabbed to death. Leo Sanchez, a Los Angeles Sheriff's Department homicide detective, later testified, there was a substantial amount of blood on her face and there was a large laceration in her neck below the chin. Sanchez estimated the wound to be four to six inches long and said there was a bloody kitchen knife lying near her body. The detective immediately tagged it as the most likely murder weapon. Ray Lugo, another LASD detective who'd been put in charge of the case, called Daisy's mother, Susan, a few hours after they first discovered the body. At that point, they weren't certain it was Daisy. Lugo asked Susan when she had last seen her daughter, which didn't alarm Susan at first. Daisy had stepped out the night before, vague about her purpose, and Susan figured she had stayed the night at her boyfriend's house. Daisy knew her mother did not approve of her boyfriend, so Susan figured that she just hadn't mentioned him in her plans. But when Detective Lugo asked Susan about that boyfriend the next day, she suddenly felt like something had gone wrong. 
Susan told New York Magazine's The Cut, When they said that, my heart sunk. Daisy had admitted a few months earlier that her on-again, off-again boyfriend sometimes physically abused her. And after that, Susan had banned him from their apartment. Daisy continued to see him elsewhere, but about a month before she was murdered, her mother said Daisy had told her she was done with what's-his-face for good. Susan told The Cut, I honestly think she had broken up with him so many times before, but this time, I think she really didn't love him anymore. I really believe it, and I think that's one of the main reasons the murder happened. Susan said that she, Daisy, and Daisy's grandmother were watching TV in the family's apartment the night of February 22nd. Daisy got a text message at about 10 p.m. Although she normally didn't pry through her daughter's phone, Susan said she could see from her position on the couch that the message was from Daisy's supposed ex. Daisy saw her mother's unhappy look and reassured her that she'd be right back. Susan said to the cut, I kind of looked at her and then she said, I'll be right back. She didn't think anything else about her daughter's absence for the rest of the night, except to be a little disappointed that the ex had once again secured his grasp on Daisy. A dreaded call from the LASD came the next day. Susan was at work when she heard about Daisy, but got a co-worker to drive her home to the apartment complex where her daughter still lay on the ground, roped off with yellow crime scene tape. Susan said she screamed, where's my baby, over and over, but she got no response from the police and forensic workers already on scene. Finally, Susan spotted a body bag and she said, I collapsed and started screaming. Although Daisy's family and friends all immediately suspected her abusive boyfriend, the police were much more cautious with their initial theories. This, Detective Lugo told The Cut, was because they had to be 100% certain with no doubts before they named a suspect. The boyfriend was definitely on their list of possibilities, but the evidence on the scene was by no means conclusive. A surveillance camera on that side of the apartment buildings had caught footage of a figure pulling what looked like Daisy's body on the morning of February 23rd, but the figure wasn't clear, just a blurry male human shape without any details, which made the footage useless. A 13-year-old boy would also come forward as an eyewitness, but not until much later in the investigation. Detective Lugo said in the article, a whodunit such as Daisy's case, they're not easy to solve. It takes a while. What if she was attacked by a stranger? In that area, they find girls there. We can't make a mistake. We have to be positive and we have to prove it. It wasn't that obvious. The people who took the case into their own hands later, however, maintained that police did not start with the obvious theory because Daisy was Hispanic. That sense of injustice would end up driving her case to the top of a huge grassroots movement propelled by social media. Daisy Marisol de la O was born on August 29, 2001, to her mother, Susan Salas, and her then-husband. They lived together with Daisy and her two brothers in Huntington Park, California, in one of the many single-family houses that dotted the suburb. When Susan and her husband got divorced, she moved the kids with her to Compton. Susan described her daughter Daisy as being a loving, outgoing child who grew into early maturity, as was sometimes necessary for kids in the area. Susan told The Cut that Daisy knew how to choose her friends, but that she had less luck appraising romantic partners. Susan said about her daughter, she was young, you know, naive, which one of us hasn't chosen a guy that's a loser? Daisy met Victor Sosa through a dating app when she was 15 and he was 21. Soon, she started hiding all the details of her new boyfriend from her mother, who didn't realize Daisy was lying about their age gap until Susan spotted tattoos on Sosa's arms. And not long into their relationship, Daisy's evasiveness started to mask something much more sinister. Sosa began physically abusing Daisy almost as quickly as they began dating. Daisy's friends and her mother started noticing bite marks, scratches, and bruises on her a few months after she began dating Sosa. 
but when they asked Daisy about them, she'd brush them off as no big deal, then change the subject. Her close high school friend, Rebecca Fuentes, said the only secrets Daisy kept from her were about her relationship with Sosa. She knows that we would have all pushed her to walk away, Fuentes told The Cut. I personally think she knew that if she tried to walk away, he would physically hurt her. She just never thought it'd get to this point. Susan said that Daisy denied and deflected when she expressed concern as well. She said about Daisy, she would never admit it. She was embarrassed, you know. But as Daisy's relationship with Sosa continued on a dangerous path, a few more serious incidents made hiding the abuse much more difficult. Daisy's younger brother, Nathan, said he saw Sosa strangle his sister when the three of them were at the De La O's apartment while Susan wasn't home. Another time, when the three of them were alone, Nathan heard Sosa start to argue and then physically attack Daisy in the top bunk of the bed she and Nathan shared. Nathan said he intervened both times to keep Sosa from attacking his sister further, pushing Sosa away from Daisy and placing himself in front of her. There was one incident from which Nathan could not protect his sister because she was too far away. On one particular day, when Daisy was in her last year of high school, Nathan saw her and Sosa outside of the De La O's apartment building. He watched them together from inside until suddenly, Sosa hit his sister over the head with a skateboard. Nathan rushed outside to help, but by that time, both Sosa and Daisy had fled the scene while Daisy's head was bleeding. She didn't come back to the apartment until later in the day. When Daisy arrived, Susan was home and startled to see a cut on her daughter's forehead, one that needed stitches. While they were at the hospital, Susan tried to file a police report, but since Daisy refused to accuse Sosa of being her assailant, the process went nowhere. Susan argued that Daisy, at 17 years old, was still a minor and therefore, as her mother, she should be able to make the report herself. Susan said she went to the police departments in Compton, Huntington Park, and the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office, but they all told her the same thing. If Daisy wasn't willing to make the accusation herself, they could not file a report on Sosa. Police representatives from those departments all told the cut that when domestic violence is involved, it's hard to prove there was a crime if there is no accuser or self-identified victim even when a minor child is involved and has an advocate who is of majority age. Police records regarding domestic violence and other crimes involving minors are kept confidential in California, so it's difficult to know whether a report was actually filed in this case. One thing that Susan could do was contact the administration at Daisy's High School and tell them about what Sosa had done to her daughter. Daisy's brother, Nathan, added his testimony, and although Daisy still denied the incident at first, she broke down when she heard her brother's input. She then admitted that it was true, and her brother was not lying. She used the Hispanic saying, Le pusinaro un cuatro, which loosely translates to, they set a trap, to describe her situation. After that incident, Daisy's high school officially banned Sosa from its grounds, according to Susan. The administrators at Daisy's school told The Cut that they do not comment on incidents that involve minors. This is also when Susan banned Sosa from the family's apartment. After admitting to the abuse and her mother reporting it at Daisy's high school, Daisy seemed to be moving past Sosa's influence as she graduated high school. She stayed with her family as she worked an evening job at CVS. She saved money for her first car and attended business administration classes at East Los Angeles College. Daisy wanted to eventually own a beauty shop where she'd specialize in makeup and tattoos. In the meantime, she studied, saved money, worked, and dyed her hair unique colors like bright turquoise paired with black. Susan thought her daughter had gotten Sosa completely out of her life even after all of their on and off dating over the last few years. Jasmine Garcia, a friend of Daisy's from high school, however, knew it wasn't that simple. Jasmine told The Cut, Daisy's also not the type of person to leave a person hanging. If a person was doing bad, she'd check up on them. 
Even if she tried cutting ties, she wouldn't do it completely because she cared too much. Jasmine thinks that Daisy's sense of protective kindness is the reason she answered Sosa's text message on the night of February 22nd. Priceline presents Go to Your Happy Price. What's up? It's Kaylee Cuoco. When it comes to travel, we all have a happy place. You can see yourself already there. It's beautiful. It might be sunny and sandy for some, neon and urban for others, deserts or rainforests or hiking trails. With Priceline, you can get to your happy place for a happy price with deals you really can't find anywhere else. Like up to 60% off select hotels to Costa Rica or five-star hotels for two-star prices in Cabo. Go to Priceline.com and travel to your happy place for a happy price. All right, see ya. I'm off to Miami. No, actually, wow, look at that. No, I I'm going to Hawaii now. Ooh, Cancun looks nice. You know what? Belize looks pretty nice this time of year. Or, mmm, Palm Springs. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. From its start, the investigation into Daisy's murder frustrated those close to her. The only immediate media attention it received was a paragraph from a local TV affiliate, KTLA, which was as short and anonymous as the LA County Sheriff's Department press release it was based on. All the article said was an unknown woman had been found dead on the 1400th block of South Long Beach Boulevard in Compton. No other details were known, or at least publicized, at that time. And that's how Daisy's case stayed for months. Head Detective Lugo claimed that Sosa had always been a person of interest and that the department was working its way through investigation procedures as best they could from the start. He said that there were several important reasons why they didn't immediately arrest Sosa or anyone else. Detectives had to take time to review evidence from the scene, which included an attempt to match DNA from the bloody knife to Sosa. Due to an unspecified previous criminal charge, law enforcement already had Sosa's DNA on file, but processing forensic DNA can take weeks. Lugo emphasized to the cut that they had to be absolutely sure they had enough evidence against Sosa before making an arrest. Lugo said about the case against Victor Sosa, there was doubt. There was always doubt. We can't be wrong. Unfortunately, a murder investigation is not a movie, and sometimes it takes a little time. And the reason it can take a little time is because we can never be wrong, ever. And if we're not sure, we have to wait. And in this case, that's what happened. Lugo indicated that detectives had to do an extensive verification of evidence in Daisy's case, while doing the same thing for another dozen or so cases at the same time. Law enforcement didn't have any eyewitnesses at first, and Lugo said that people in the area tend to mistrust police in general, so it was difficult to get the community to cooperate. Jasmine, Rebecca, and Susan voiced the collective doubt of Daisy's loved ones the loudest. They all experienced patients that wore thin as they saw the months go by with an obvious suspect, Victor Sosa, running free. Susan remembered the three separate police departments who wouldn't take her report about her minor child getting beaten up by her older boyfriend. Jasmine thought about all the Hispanic, Latino, Black, and other victims of color who were regularly ignored by the media and police. Then, Rebecca took to TikTok, which would turn out to be a very smart move. As May of 2021 dragged on and nothing had progressed, Rebecca used her personal account to send out a plea using the hashtag Justice for Daisy. Her TikTok on May 26th highlighted her charismatic friend in a montage style. Her post began with the scant details of Daisy's murder superimposed onto a photo of her enjoying a carnival. It transitioned into photos of Sosa details of how he'd abused Daisy, and a plea for TikTok to do your thing, to spread the information everywhere so that as many people as possible would help propel Daisy's case to justice. The TikTok worked better than she imagined. Her phone was blowing up with messages about how crazy it was that viewers, even those in the same LA area, were learning about Daisy's case from social media 
instead of the news. Millions of replies and uses of the hashtag Justice for Daisy produced a bigger crowd of sleuths on the case than the police could ever do. Rebecca had been on the app long enough to see several other true crime stories resolve themselves through social media posts. Most recently, the case of Gabby Petito, a young woman who went missing while on a cross-country trip with her fiancé, had garnered hundreds of millions of views on Instagram before her remains had been found and her fiancé confessed to her killing. And to Rebecca, a young person who connected with her friends and strangers online, it seemed like a natural step to share Daisy's information publicly. Since the TikTok algorithm recommends specific content that users don't follow and thus might not otherwise see, putting Daisy on the site would get her seen by more people than on sites that only showed users' content by people they followed. Social media has become a major aspect in criminal investigations since its inception. Experts are somewhat divided on how effective it can be. Retired Detective Paul Holes, a veteran investigator with the Contra Costa County District Attorney's Office in California, explained both sides in a Rolling Stone article. Holes said that his recent work on the Golden State Killer case was flooded with information from true crime fans after the details became public and spread through social media. Not all of it was helpful. Holes explained, I was getting spammed continuously by people who had their own theories and developed suspects. I had to follow my own theories and investigative process. He told Rolling Stone that putting crime details on social media gives police and other investigators an unprecedented immediate way to stay in touch with those who may have valuable information and vice versa. But both sides have to know how to use the system responsibly. Holes said police should adjust their content to evolve more with professional social media posting standards, and he emphasized that people should take thorough steps to verify information before sharing it or acting on it in any way. Leone Pretorius came to the same conclusion in their presentation at the 2021 Debating Communities and Networks 13 conference. In their paper, Social Media and Its Effects on Solving Crime, Pretorius provides several examples of how social media has permanently changed criminal investigations, concluding that social media has incited social change in that it is not only a tool that helps law enforcement fight crime, but it has also changed the way they get messages out to the public. In Rebecca's case, her call on behalf of Daisy for benign vigilantism actually worked. As soon as Rebecca put out the call for TikTok users to be on the lookout for Sosa, responses came pouring in. People told her where they were to show how far the information had spread. Several people thought Sosa looked vaguely familiar, and a few more claimed to know relatives of his and said they'd check up on them to see if any of Sosa's family had heard from him. At the same time, Susan's cousin Noemi set up a public Instagram account called Justice for Daisy to get the word out on a different platform. Only a few social media users offered any actual tips on the case, but the flood of support helped in its own way by propelling Daisy's story into coverage from the mainstream media. The L.A. County Sheriff's Department finally declared Sosa an official suspect and put out a wanted poster in late June of 2021. They posted it on the department's own Facebook page, bordered with yellow and stating, wanted for murder. Local outlets picked up the investigation again, this time using Daisy's name and the poster to flesh out the initial scant homicide report. The poster described Victor Hugo Sosa as being 25 years old and Hispanic. He was listed as being 5 feet 6 inches tall and weighing 130 pounds. His photo shows a smoothed-faced young man with a wispy black mustache over his slight smile. In the image from 2017, the hair on top of his head is much thicker, grown into black waves that reach between his ears and shoulders. His eyes are brown under thick but straight eyebrows. The poster also stated that Sosa should be considered armed and dangerous, and that he tended to use a skateboard and public transportation like the local bus to get around. But by the time that poster was made public, Sosa was already long gone from Compton. 
In fact, he was out of the country and was already easing into a new life in Mexico. Exactly who discovered Sosa's location and how is somewhat in dispute. Susan and Noemi say that Noemi received a video clip as a direct message from the Instagram account she'd created. The DM claimed that the sender recognized Victor as a co-worker at the Papas and Beer Bar in Rosarito, Mexico, and had taken the video to send Noemi as proof. Noemi took screenshots before the video disappeared and sent them to Daisy's mother, Susan, on July 1st. Noemi had been getting tons of replies and tips that didn't end up going anywhere, and she had started acting as a vetting system to keep Susan from getting overwhelmed and even more frustrated than she already was. But that first day of July was different. Noemi caught Susan while she was driving and told her to call her back. Susan spoke about the phone call with the cut, saying, She's like, Susie, I'm gonna send you something. I need you to tell me, is that him? When she sent me the picture, I was like, it's him. Sosa had bleached his hair blonde, but otherwise was taking no apparent caution to hide from authorities. Noemi's screenshot showed him at a bar with a cigarette and a beer, appearing completely at ease, which made Susan angry. Seeing him so relaxed, it did something to me, honestly, she told the cut. With a cigarette enjoying the music, you know, that really drove me crazy. Susan said she immediately forwarded the images to Detective Lugo, as she said she'd been doing with any promising tips that Noemi sent her. According to Detective Lugo, however, none of the tips Susan had sent him were any help. He further claimed that he had already discovered Sosa's location on his own through connections with Mexican police in the area. In a Los Angeles Times article about the process, Lugo did say that the department received the information through a social media account, but he said it wasn't from Susan or Noemi. Looking at the bigger picture, it didn't matter who discovered Sosa's location. Just a day after police got the tip, about his new location on July 2nd, Mexican police arrested him. Sosa was extradited to California and charged with the first-degree murder of Daisy De La O. Victor Sosa was held on $2 million bail at the Los Angeles Men's Central Jail. He pleaded not guilty, but several previously unknown witnesses would contradict that at a September 2021 preliminary hearing. First, Daisy's grandfather testified that he had seen Sosa staring into the family's apartment the night of the attack before Daisy went out to meet him. A young boy also claimed to have seen Sosa at the crime scene the next morning. The defense questioned the reliability of both witnesses since neither of them had come forward with this information before the hearing. Any previous witnesses who testified for the prosecution seemed somewhat insignificant once Victor Sosa's own mother, Claudia Gutierrez, took the stand for the prosecution. Gutierrez testified that her son had indirectly admitted to her that he had killed Daisy. According to the Oxygen Network's coverage, the deputy DA asked Gutierrez, what did you ask him? To which she replied, if he'd done it if he'd committed the crime. As for Victor's response, Gutierrez said he just bowed his head down. After that, Gutierrez told the cut she encouraged her son to do the right thing and turn himself in. In addition to the eyewitness accounts, investigators who worked on the case testified, describing Daisy's fatal wounds in detail. On September 7, 2021, the L.A. County judge in charge of the hearing ruled that there was enough evidence to proceed with a criminal trial. Continuing to harness the momentum she'd garnered on TikTok, Rebecca made sure that Daisy's case remained in the headlines until the very end to guarantee what she considered the proper punishment for Victor's crime. Noemi also kept the Justice for Daisy Instagram account up to date throughout all of the legal proceedings. Both Rebecca and Noemi believed that social media had been instrumental in bringing national attention to Daisy's case and keeping her there until Sosa could be apprehended. Rebecca told The Cut, I believe he would still be out there. 
The only reason he got caught was because someone recognized him from the videos we were making. The TikTok and Instagram account also served as a way to solicit extra support for Daisy's family. Sosa's court date was pushed back several times throughout the early months of 2022. Because of the numerous delays, legal fees, and time off from work for Susie to attend court proceedings, Daisy's mother had a difficult time making ends meet. Noemi created a GoFundMe for her cousin and used the Instagram account to ask for contributions. At the same time, Rebecca encouraged her audience to rally outside the courthouse and advocate for a harsh sentence. Finally, Sosa's criminal trial began on April 20th, 2022. On that same day, Susie posted a personal statement on the hashtag Justice for Daisy account that read in part, my daughter's murder changed my life forever. Burying a child is something that is not natural. The day I have to leave this world, I will be happy that I finally hug her and tell her I miss her. Susie went on to say thank you for all of the support that had come in through social media. The trial ended with closing arguments on April 28th and May 4th, and then the jury were sent to deliberate. The jury convicted Victor Sosa for the first-degree murder of Daisy De La O. After the conviction, a post on the hashtag Justice for Daisy social media account read, Justice has been served today. Like the trial itself, Sosa's sentencing hearing continues to get pushed back further and further into the year. It was originally scheduled for about a month after the verdict was delivered, but was rescheduled several times in June of this year. The hearing is currently scheduled for October 12, 2022. Rebecca is hoping for the maximum sentence possible, but Susie realizes that she will probably never be satisfied with the results, no matter what the sentence ends up being. Susie told local news KTLA, no matter how many years he gets in jail, I can never get her back. He stole so much from me. Nonetheless, Susie is elated that justice has been served for her Daisy. It's been said that social media attention can sometimes cause more harm than good for serious crime cases if information being posted isn't accurate, for example. In Daisy De La O's case, however, social media played a critical role in bringing her killer to justice. Though the young woman who loved to cook and hoped to own her own business one day was taken from this world far too soon, I hope her family finds solace in seeing justice done thanks in large part to people who used social media to make damn sure that Daisy De La O's name would be known worldwide. Thanks so much for joining me on this episode of Murderish. Make sure you're following me on Instagram and TikTok at Jamie on Air. That's J-A-M-I on Air on Instagram and TikTok. If you'd rather listen to the podcast with no interruptions, sign up for Murderish Behind the Mic on Patreon. As a patron, you can get access to bonus content, ad-free episodes, and other cool perks. To sign up for Murderish Behind the Mic, visit Murderish.com or just go to Patreon.com and search for Murderish there. If you're looking for more podcasts to listen to, I host another true crime podcast called Dirty Money Moves Women in White Collar Crime. Dirty Money Moves follows my investigation of a woman I met a few years ago, a woman who turned out to be a prolific scam artist. It's a wild story that even has ties to the Michael Jackson scandal. You can subscribe to Dirty Money Moves wherever you're listening right now. There are a bunch of episodes for you to binge. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave Murderish a positive rating and review in any podcast app. I want to say a big thank you to everyone who contributed to making this episode. You can find their names in the episode notes. And remember, listening to this podcast doesn't make you a murderer. It just means you're murder-ish. Are you fascinated by true crime stories? Then join me on the Casual Criminalist podcast, where we dive deep into some of the most intriguing criminal cases of our time. From the Oakland County child killer to the bizarre case of Paul Warner Powell, the man who sent himself to the electric chair, 
They're going to take you on a journey through the criminal minds and explore the toughest cases. Twice each week, we bring you a new story, such as the Lululemon murder and John Lennon Orr, the firefighter turned arsonist and murderer. If you're ready for a journey into the world of true crime, then subscribe now to The Casual Criminalist.